Welcome back to the amino acid playlist. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at, number one, a brief review of the synthesis of GABA, which is this guy right here. We'll look at the synthesis of GABA. But what I want to have you keep in the back of your mind is this, is that if you have to synthesize a neurotransmitter, okay, you also have to have a way to degrade it. When we say degrade a neurotransmitter or degrade a hormone, whatever, what we're really doing is we're terminating the response. Um, in another video, we looked at the synthesis of acetylcholine, and like we have a way to synthesize it, we also have to have a way to destroy it, and that's done by the action of acetylcholinesterase. So you have we have this big idea that we have syntheses for these guys, but we also have to have a, a catabolic pathway. Now. In general, with most of these neurotransmitters, um, the mode of getting rid of these is, you know, we hydroxylate, we sulfate, glucuronidate. In one, in one case, we used a phosphoribosyl transferase. In this case, it's a little bit different because GABA can actually be turned into energy. And that's very unusual for a neurotransmitter hormone. Uh, there's not many like that at all. Now, review from the last video, we talked a lot about this reaction, glutamate decarboxylase. We even looked at the mechanism of that enzyme. And glutamate gets converted into, into GABA, which is right here. And by the way, GABA stands for gamma, gamma aminobutyrate. Gamma aminobutyrate. Okay, and aminobutyrate is one word. Okay, but in any case, it gets converted into GABA by glutamate decarboxylase. This is a pyridoxal phosphate dependent enzyme, so this requires PLP. Of course, you're going to have the Schiff base formation and all that. You can go back to the last video and look at the mechanism. But what we're going to get off is CO2, and this carbon dioxide that's produced by this reaction is of the alpha carboxyl group. Keep in mind that with glutamate, you have multiple carboxyl groups. Let me do this in a color that's easy to see, orange. You have an alpha carboxyl group, you have a beta carbon, and then you also have a gamma carboxyl group. Okay, So we're only removing the alpha carbon, or excuse me, the alpha carboxyl group. Okay, And that's going to give us GABA. Okay, Now GABA is going to behave very similarly to the way a normal amino acid would. In fact, it is an amino acid. Um, amino acids at physiological pH are defined by having the carboxyl group and an amine. Okay, that's how an amino acid is defined at physiological pH. Okay, but it turns out that even though the carboxyl group is technically in the wrong place for it to be one of the normal 20, catabolically it's going to behave very similarly. What we're going to do is we're going to transaminate it and then convert it down to energy, which is normally what we do anyways to normal uh, members of the 20 uh, primary amino acids. And the, the reaction that's going to transaminate it is called GABA transaminase or GABA aminotransferase. And what it's going to do is it's going to use molecules that we're used to seeing, like this right here. This is alpha-ketoglutarate. And just like in the case of normal transaminase reactions, what we're essentially going to have is we're going to have amines, like this one right here, and the amine is you could effectively think of it as interconverting with a carbonyl. Now, mechanistically, we know that not to be the case. They're not like substitutions. But in, for the purpose of taking an exam, if you're trying to remember structures, there's substitutions between amines and carbonyls. Now, notice that this amine is a primary amine, meaning it just has one R group attached to it. So in that case, it's not going to give us a ketone. It's going to give us an aldehyde, as shown right here. So when you transaminate GABA with alpha-ketoglutarate, you, number one, end up generating L-glutamate. But you also generate succinate semialdehyde. Okay? So this right here, this is succinate semialdehyde. And the reason they call it semialdehyde is because it's basically succinate. Keep in mind that this group right here, essentially, we can draw it in. That's a hydrogen. But it's essentially succinate, except this group over here is just an aldehyde. Okay, so that's why they call it succinate semialdehyde. If this hydrogen right here was replaced with an O minus, it would be succinate. In fact, that's actually what we're going to do, and you could probably guess that based on the structure. Okay, what we're going to do is use an enzyme called succinate semialdehyde dehydrogenase. 
This is just one of your typical aldehyde dehydrogenases. We know that for aldehyde dehydrogenases is that if you have some R group attached to an aldehyde and you use one of these things, first of all, you'll dehydrogenate it. So you'll get out NADH. And then the last step is you put in water to hydrolyze off the protein. Because actually what you do initially is you make a protein um, substrate linkage, you dehydrogenate it, and then you hydrolyze it off. But we know that what you should get is a carboxylate. And that's exactly what we see in the case of succinate. So succinate is our final product. It's the product of succinate semialdehyde dehydrogenase. And we know what happens to succinate. It's just going to go into the TCA cycle. And if I think about what happens to succinate, think about when it goes into the TCA cycle, keep in mind that it bypasses isocitrate dehydrogenase. You know, it bypasses alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex. But there are some enzymes it's going to react with before you get to the end of the cycle. For example, it will react with succinate dehydrogenase. And the electrons are initially going to go to FADH2, but we know that those electrons end up reducing ubiquinone into a totally reduced ubiquinol. So we get a ubiquinol out of succinate going into the TCA cycle. And we also know that that generates fumarate, which reacts with fumarate hydratase to give malate. And then malate's going to react with malate dehydrogenase to give us an NADH. So when we synthesize GABA from glutamate, Okay. Remember, glutamate is the excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, or the central nervous system. GABA is the inhibitory central nervous system neurotransmitter. So when we catabolize GABA into this pathway, which is, by the way, called the GABA shunt. So let me write that down. This whole pathway, this is called the GABA, the GABA shunt. And it's called that because we're shunting GABA into the TCA cycle. And so it's not a total waste or a total loss by making GABA. When we want to terminate the response, we're actually going to get some energy out of it. So, and then by the way, this shouldn't be there. This should be just NADH. So we're going to get NADH and a totally reduced ubiquinol. So I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on what the GABA shunt is. In other videos, we'll look at the physiology of GABA and so forth. See you in the next video.